Okay. Um, this is actually a second attempt. I hope everyone can hear me well this time. Uh, we had a technical difficulty. Uh, so today's talk I wanted to give you is about um, code review. And I called it um, hypercritical code review of C++, but we'll see how hyper it's going to be. Um, during the talk, I will pause uh, to uh, give you uh, uh, some time to ask questions. Well, rather, I will pause to read your questions in the question section of this talk. Uh, so uh, let's um, finally begin, shall we? OK. Uh, just a couple of words about me. I'm working at PVS Studio, and we are making a static code analysis for C, C++, C Sharp, and Java currently. I'm working specifically on the core module. Uh, what is this all about? Um, well, you know, we all do code reviews. It's an essential part of the uh, development process in every field, I think, where programming is involved. And who doesn't admit, admit this, uh, does it twice as often. I'm not saying they're necessarily lying or hiding something, but you know, if you don't do it properly uh, first time, you will probably um, have to redo it again. OK. Um, um, and nobody is going to blame you, uh, of course, for doing code reviews on your code, but you should be careful at times. At, at times, you should be extremely careful because there are things you can miss easily, and uh, those things will bite you uh, on the long run. So something like this um, may be a good idea to have. OK, enough kidding. Um, so the first thing uh, we are going to talk about is auto. You know, everyone knows auto. Everyone, I hope, loves auto because it's really a handy tool uh, that we have in the language. But uh, let's take a look at this uh, piece of code. Oh, nothing really weird um, here except it's an indexed loop, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so I don't know about you, but my first instinct would be to write auto for a variable if I know uh, what I want stored there. And what do you think uh, is, going, is going to be here when auto resolves? It's going to be, of course, int. Because zero is an integer value and int is the default. Um, so let's assume you see this code in your uh, during your review in your code base. Uh, what does it tell you? Well, it's int. So it's bad for 64-bit systems because in 64-bit uh, you can address a lot more than an int allows and at the right side there, the vector size uh, is a value uh, which may be larger than int. Well, on 64-bit systems, it will be larger than int. Um, also, why is it bad? Signed, unsigned uh, gets mixed up here. And if you're lucky, your compiler will tell you that, um, OK, something is wrong here. Uh, you shouldn't probably do that because you're comparing an assigned value to an unsigned value. Uh, so oh, what are we supposed to do? Let's see. Um, that's better, I think. Uh, but I personally don't really like that because you have to specify a type here. And um, to be like, totally precise, you have to write uh, vector size type uh, instead of just size t. I know it's going to be size t, but uh, to be correct, 
uh, you're expected, I think, to write size type of the vector. Uh, so what uh, I would typically do is this. Um, I know you can't really answer <laughs> to my questions, uh, which I addressed to you, but I will ask anyway, does anyone see any problem here? Or well, probably not, but if we have uh, 128 bit systems sometime, someday in the future, it will probably also be bad. Um, but I actually have a good solution for all those problems is just to get rid of the index loop uh, like completely because uh, index loops are inconvenient. You can make mistakes there. You can put incorrect types there. There are a lot of problems with indexed loops, OK? Uh, OK, so look, I, I fixed that. Um, that's now working without problems. And we don't really care about uh, what the type of the index is. We don't care about the um, uh, running out of the vector's bounds. And uh, it works generally faster and better. OK. and. The next one, the next thing I wanted to address about auto is, well, rather about a careless use of auto is uh, what I call a misreference. If you can spot um, an error here right away, great. Uh, I know some people can, some people overlook it a lot, but look here. And then look here. So what we see here in this uh, code fragment is we have auto on the left and a reference on the right. So when the assignment happens, the copy will happen. It might not be really bad. Uh, in many situations, maybe it's OK. Like if you have something constant if you don't uh, if you don't want to really uh, change the variable if you are making it const it's not a big deal but if you are expecting to do something with it uh, let's assume you take it from some collection or a ray or something uh, something along those lines uh, it's going to be bad if it's a heavy object um, which is difficult to copy, it's going to be bad. So look out for auto, especially when it's used, well, in some long um, expressions or some, uh, you know, unobvious places like in a loop counter. Uh, and there is, an, of course, there is an easy solution if you can spot it. It's just put um, a ref there. Uh, and really, if you are very, very much into this sort of stuff, you can write Jekyll type auto. And uh, it's going to work the same way as um, putting a ref there. I personally, I prefer putting ref qualifiers to my autos because they tend to be easier to read, in my opinion, but uh, I guess it's individual. Uh, and during this uh, presentations, I'm I'm going to give you some I don't know some advice on what to look for. I decided to make it in this kind of um, commandment type thing, but it's just. Um, uh, um, just to show off, I guess. So, thou shalt not auto unless thy faith is strong and pure. What it really means is use auto if you're sure what, uh, what you're doing, if you're sure it won't shoot yourself in the foot. And here, let's make a little pause. I'll go and check if there are any questions in the questions section. Um, if there are, I can answer them right now. Okay, no questions, uh, moving on. 
Um, now, this one might be a kind of a counterintuitive one, because really it is. It's based on an article. I'll put the QR code here just uh, in case you want to go check the article out, it's really good. Uh, so where the counterintuitivity here? Let's go. Uh, let's say you have a function which takes a vector by reference. And this vector, we don't care about uh, the type stored there for now, but we'll, we will care about it later. Uh, and you go again in an index loop. Uh, notice I put size t here this time, so no ints for us. Uh, and you increment uh, every element of the vector. You address it using the uh, square bracket separator. Uh, now, let's look at the loop a little bit closer. And what do you think is faster? Uh, if we do it like that, if the vector holds in 32 values, or if it holds, uh, well, basically, essentially, char values. Uh, the intuition might be telling you, well, it was telling me that maybe a, a smaller size of the element will somehow help it to uh, work faster because you you're dealing with uh, less amount of bytes uh, basically uh, so what's the best way to figure out for sure is benchmark right so let's take uh, two major compilers uh, GC and clan and let's check what's going on here well as you can see uh, those time units by the way um, uh, they are largely proportions, uh, normalized values. It, it doesn't really matter uh, what those are. Uh, what matters is uh, how they relate to each other. Let's say they are milliseconds. Uh, so GCC uh, compiles and runs uh, this thing in two time units uh, for int unit 8 and uh, for unit 32 it uh, it becomes faster when you run our loop at um, uh, with o2 and o3 uh, optimizations we are interested in o2 mostly because I think most people will use it anyway so GC uh, goes faster if you put uh, 32 uh, bit ints into your vector. Clan, again, it goes so much faster. Uh, why does it go that fast? Actually, much faster than GC because Clan, spoiler alert, uh, Clan very aggressively unrolls loops. Uh, so under O2, it will be. Uh, Lightning fast uh, GC under O3 will do basically the same. Okay, uh, so how how is it so that under clan uh, a vector of UIN 32s um, gets so much speed over a vector of UIN 8s? So let's see. Uh, let's go to CodeBolt and actually. Uh, Compile it, and I've put at the right here. I've put the actual roughly equivalent C++ like code. So it's it's not C++ really. Uh, it's just to give you an idea of what's going on. So vector of ints. Okay. So let's let's check out what's what's going on here. So it takes the iterator to the first element. Uh, it takes an iterator to the last element, compares them, and then it goes into this uh, loop here. And um, this is where it calculates the size. So as you can see, uh, this is our loop. 
And here it goes, it reobtains both begin and end pointers uh, when it, well, as it goes, as it iterates. Um, compare that to the vector of 32 bit and uh, what we can see here is. Uh, it saves the pointer to the start of the internal buffer of the vector. Now it goes and calculates an uh, end pointer, and then it simply goes basically incrementing a pointer and incrementing a value uh, to which it points to. Uh, let's see them side by side. Again, I've highlighted uh, the most important part here. Uh, part here, um, in case of 32-bit uh, int, uh, uh, as you can see, all the iterators are nicely calculated at the very beginning of the function. And uh, if we have uint8, uh, we recalculate them every time in a loop. So that's what contributes to um, to the slowdown of uh, essentially a vector of bytes. So let's try to optimize it um, because the index loops are not really the best solution anyway. So let's see what, uh, let's do exactly what the compiler does and put um, the iterators before the loop and see what uh, gets generated uh, in this case. Uh, compile it again and hey, look, uh, it did exactly what we asked it to do. It put the iterators before the actual loop and it doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, really tries to calculate them anymore. So the loop is nice and small and small and Let's uh, give it one more try with a benchmark. Uh, so those are numbers before and after. Uh, I used O2 here because O2 is really, I think, what most people are using. Uh, GCC is kind of losing here to clan again because of the loop unrolling uh, clan does. Uh, but as you can see, uh, the increase in speed of the loop uh, is really huge, especially when you uh, when you can optimize the entire loop by enrolling it. Um, so why this happens? Um, it happens before when we do code like that, uh, we dereference and increment an iterator and we don't address the internal vectors uh, fields anymore. Uh, when we did uh, the same thing basically with uh, an index, what happened there is pointer aliasing happened. Uh, when an increment on an element of a vector occurred, Essentially, what this does, it dereferences a pointer and it uh, increments its value. And the compiler was assuming that if you do that, anything uh, can change uh, in your in the same area of memory. Uh, and it was recalculating the size every time. Um, it happened because of. Uh, basically chars which were stored in our vector. Uh, as you can know, as you know, probably chars alias with anything at all. Uh, so a pointer to char is, uh, can alias with any other pointer in memory. So the compiler was assuming that you can overwrite uh, internal um, internal fields of the vector itself because the vector was obtained by reference uh, to the function. Uh, well, anyway, this code with an iterator 
at the beginning with the second iterator at the beginning and an increment in the loop, does it by chance remind you of anything? Well, how about this? Um, it reminds really of a range-based loop. And if we look how that works, uh, we indeed can see that it's basically what we wrote <laughs> um, in the previous example. Uh, so the moral of this story is don't really write uh, index loops unless you need to iterate maybe over some small portion of a container, if you use containers. Uh, use iterators if you want to iterate over the entire thing. Uh, use range-based loops. Uh, they really can't uh, go wrong, uh, so you're safe there. And what I usually do in code reviews, if I see an index loops, uh, an index loop somewhere in someone's code, there should be a good reason why it's there. Okay, uh, let's make a break here. Uh, let's see if there are any questions. I probably should wait like 20 seconds additionally uh, in order to uh, see them, but because there is a delay in the stream. Okay. Uh, no questions so far. Let's go. Uh, let's go next. This one about uh, oh, privacy, uh, it's more about security. So look at that. Um, look at that. Uh, what do we have here? We do some uh, password processing. So as you can see, there is a function which probably asks a user to enter the password. It uh, puts that password into a pre-allocated uh, buffer of however many elements you want in a static array in a, in a function. And then it uh, gives it over to another function for some magic. And then uh, the purpose of that last line here of this one is to zero the memory out because uh, if you just uh, if you just leave the function, uh, your array you've allocated in this case will still be on the stack. Uh, so your data uh, is there; it's in the memory, and there are ways to extract it and use it somehow uh, against you. Um, and there are many cases where code like this is used, especially in applications when where people want to zero the memory out because they are working with some se sensitive data. Uh, but what uh, do you think really happens here? Well, I think what happens here we shall see on the next uh, on the next slide. So go to Godbolt again. Uh, put this into this site and compile it. In this case, I chose Clan 10 uh, and put O2 there. So uh, where's my mem set? It's gone. Um, this is a problem with uh, security, uh, and it's an old problem, really, uh, but it still exists because uh, compilers are smart these days. They will, they really like to optimize things away if they think those things do nothing or detrimental or UB. Uh, in this case, of course. There's no UB uh, from the point of view of a compiler. It's just a useless operation which does nothing, basically, because the uh, variable you are trying to zero out uh, will go to, out of scope and die. So why bother, right? Um, if it looks contrived, and I know to some people it looks contrived, uh, well, it isn't. There is this thing called uh, common weakness enumeration. 
Uh, and this uh, problem with MEMSET is uh, classified there uh, and it's described uh, based on actually potential security risks uh, that you can encounter. So if you need to mm, zero out some sensitive memory, what can you do? Well, not much really, but you can do some stuff. You can write your own MEMSET uh, implementation, which will zero the memory out. Uh, you then hide it uh, from the compiler, basically in a different uh, CPP file, and just include it uh, we, um, via a header. And an important bit here is, of course, disable link time optimization because if you don't disable it, uh, the linker will find the uh, function and inlining will still occur. Uh, the compiler will see what it does and it will actually optimize it away properly. Um, you can access a non-volatile object you need to zero out through a volatile pointer. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it, well, in most cases it helps, I would say. You can call memset using a volatile function pointer. This one is funny, really, but it seems to be working uh, because the compiler doesn't want, uh, when it sees a call to a function uh, via a volatile function pointer, uh, it doesn't optimize it away. Um, you can use an, some piece of assembly code, also volatile. Uh, you can use memory barriers uh, to prevent the compiler from optimizing the way because you require this operation to take place and in a specific manner. Also, you can disable uh, some of the compiler optimizations. Uh, and if you use C and you're lucky, and you see 11 uh, memset s should take care of it for you memset underscore s so the moral of this story is if you have sensitive data uh, make sure it's um, securely uh, erased from memory uh, before you uh, before you leave it just hanging around or deleting the pointer to it or whatever um, and don't use just plain memset. Okay, speaking of washing your data and privacy and stuff like that, um, there is a big problem is that it's also a security risk. And a big problem is some applications which get input. Uh, from the outside, uh, don't bother checking that input for correctness, for safety, and so on. So let's look at this uh, small example. Um, what happens here is we just read something from the STD in. So just ask, uh, we ask a user to enter anything. And then we check if it's, um, an empty line, basically. And if it's an empty line, we just leave. Uh, the processing occurs uh, later in, in the code. Um, I've omitted it because it's not important here because the important bit is uh, what happens in the if uh, check and in the if body. Um, well, this one is actually from one of uh, GNU uh, GNU utilities and was classified as a, a common vulnerability um, exposure in 2015. Um, what happens here is let's say you somehow manage to pass an empty line uh, in your buffer. Um, this one will explode 
uh, why it will explode, because if the line is empty, uh, strlen will return zero. Uh, you sub subtract one from that, and you get an overflow, and you compare it to uh, a new line. OK, let's say uh, the comparison passed. Um, then you, if, if the comparison passed, uh, you put a zero um, somewhere in the memory. This can lead to memory corruption, and this can expose uh, your data, uh, which you hope, hoped to hide from strangers. Um, uh, I'm not even talking about uh, two STRLN calls in this. Mm. It's not important, but it's not a good thing to do. Well, when it was discovered back in 2015, uh, it was fixed. Um, how did they fix it? Well, they use get line instead of um, uh, just reading from the stream directly with app gets. Uh, but they didn't really fix it because it was, again, found uh, and classified as a vulnerability. Because the problem essentially remained the same. The problem wasn't in the way they read; uh, they were reading data. Uh, the problem was in the way they do the check. Um, so this one, I don't know how it passed uh, twice um, after being exposed as a vulnerability, um, as a confirmed uh, vulnerability in the utility. Uh, but anyway, it could have been fixed if um, they noticed the uh, SGRLN uh, problem there in the index. OK, so the moral of that is you really shouldn't accept data from the outside and trust it. Uh, you have to check uh, your uh, inputs uh, for at least for safety and for correctness before you use them. Um, OK. Let's move on to the next thing. And that is what I call uh, the last mile, also known as uh, control C, control V. Um, that's a problem with copying and pasting um, blocks of code. Uh, and if you tell me you never do that, I won't believe you because everyone does it. Uh, because people in general don't like to write a lot of similar code. Uh, and why is it called last mile? It's because, funnily enough, people, when copying and pasting similar, similar lines or blocks of code, they tend to make errors towards the end of, um, of the thing they copy and paste. Uh, so let's say you you copy paste 10 lines, uh, your probability of making an error in the last line uh, increases uh, as compared to all the previous lines. Uh, so let's see here. Um, well, the same function was called re really twice, but from the looks of it, uh, it seems to be that a different function was meant to be called. Um, now, uh, look at that and tell me, well, you can tell me obviously, but tell me if you can find it just by looking just at a glance. Uh, well, there are two entirely similar blocks of code that do exactly the same. Uh, this code I'm showing you, by the way, is from 
open source projects, I'm just not naming them because it's not important. We are not here to blame uh, projects. Um, we just to showcase some common problems. All right, so take a look at this one. Uh, this one is um, kind of, um, shall I say, it? not typical because the checks occur uh, uh, in two lines, which are two lines apart. But I think what happens here is that uh, someone wrote the first line, decided, okay, I've got enough of that, uh, copied and pasted three times, uh, changed values, then copied and pasted three lines again and forgot to change uh, the value in, in the last line. Uh, and yes, don't copy paste your code blocks. It may be harsh uh, because you can't really stop copying and pasting them. I don't think it's possible, uh, but at least I would recommend double checking, triple checking, and then checking on the code review. If you see uh, a wall of lines and you realize that, hey, they're similar to each other, maybe uh, you should double, triple check them for correctness. All right, uh, just another pause. Uh, we are not in a rush, I think. Okay, I've got a question. Can you use AIRAII to clear the memory in the destructor of a custom type, like a safe ray type that clears the contents during destruction? I, yes, you can. And uh, I would, I would say still uh, use, uh, still don't use memset, use something uh, which is more secure than, than Mem said, maybe uh, throw some volatiles there, but of course you can clear the memory in the destructor. And I, I think it's the preferred way to do that. Uh, if, if you want to do some sensitive data processing, I would say write a wrapper like a unique pointer around it. Uh, by the way, it's a good question. Maybe you can use unique pointers with custom deleters uh, to clear your data. Uh, I should probably check that. Okay, moving on uh, to comparison things. Um, well, it's, you know, when I was a little bit younger, I wanted to have a spaceship. Uh, and now I've got one, um, but not this one, this one. And it's a handy tool. And as we start to move to the latest standard, I would urge you to use it uh, if you need to do comparisons of your classes. Uh, why? Well, let's, like, uh, let's take a look at this kind of structure. Uh, just A and B, two ints, uh, nothing really special. Uh, let's say we want it to behave like like a value, uh, like a comparable value, which you can use, which you can compare basically for equality and relations with other similar values. So what we typically do uh, is we implement one operator and other operators go based on that one. So this is how you can implement um, the equality operator and it works great. It just compares both the fields for equality. Um, now, just to avoid code duplication, uh, typically you would do an unequality operator like that, right? So you just return the opposite of equal. Uh, and that's good. Uh, that's a good thing to do. So uh, what about these? Uh, you have four more operators to implement. How do you do that? Well, usually we pick 
one and again implement others from this one. So those two, they have equals in them, so we can use the equal separator. Uh, now we'll just let's pick one arbitrarily. Let's say we want uh, the last separator implemented first, and this one will take care of itself, basically. Um, well, there is a problem with this approach uh, because if you do that, you will compare both the fields for uh, whether they're less, uh, one is less than the other, uh, uh, and call it a day basically, right? Uh, oh, not exactly, because there are problems with that. If you do what is shown uh, here, uh, what you will get, you will get uh, just comparison of two values, but not necessarily a comparison of two optimals. Uh, what I mean by that? So let's take a look at the first one. Um, two one is less than one two. It's false. Uh, it says that this is false, and that's correct, because uh, according to the logic of the separator, uh, that's that's right. Now, what happens here uh, in the second case? It says that this is also false. Uh, and that is really uh, not what I think you would expect uh, when doing this, uh, this type of operator overloading, because uh, those two objects, uh, they seem to be both less and larger, uh, greater than each other. Okay, so how do uh, would you do that properly? Well, you have to really compare fields one one by one, uh, and this implementation will give you lexicographical comparison. So this time, um, if you look at those uh, two comparisons, this one is false. Uh, this one is true. One two is lexicographically uh, less than two one. So, good. Now, what if we have uh, a structure of just one integer? Surely we won't have any trouble with that, right? Uh, we have just one value, uh, just say integer and the float double. Um, so we have just one variable, so we can just do that, right? Uh, this seems logical, just compare the internal uh, field uh, to uh, the same field of a different object, and it should be fine. Well, it turns out that mm, it looks fine in this case. Um, what if you do that? Uh, what if your field is not a number, a special, mm, a special value for a double float? Well, in this case, it will be false, and it's actually correct because uh, numbers are usually, uh, well, they are supposed to be less than uh, not a number value. But now we don't, uh, now we have a problem, don't we? Uh, because if we do that and we have the uh, operator implementation as shown above, what we get is true. And this is incorrect because uh, one uh, cannot be greater or equal to not a number. That's a, that's completely wrong. Well, there are uh, ways to overcome this. Currently, you can check if it's um, if it's not a number, and then do the comparison in this case. But what? we want to do and what we will be able to do is basically this. Uh, you need to include compare, by the way, before doing that. Because what this will give us is it will, by default, do lexicographical comparisons. So our integer um, cases will take care for themselves. Uh, and our float cases or double will take care uh, of themselves because uh, 
the compiler will correctly compare values with not a number value. And by the way, while we are at it, uh, this is my pet peeve, but um, uh, I'll show it to you. What in the living world is that? Uh, please don't do that. I found this in our uh, in our code in our analyzer in one of the diagnostic rules, at Turing code review, and this is unreadable. But somebody must really love their ternary operations. Uh, I think it's uh, really a good feeling to love something. Okay. Uh, the moral of this: if you write comparisons. Make sure you write them correctly or use automatic um, solutions, which will be available to you uh, from C20. Okay, I believe we are kind of running out of time here. Uh, let's really quickly do a couple more things. Uh, also, from our code. Um, so, we have a structure like this. Uh, it has some fields. It has a constructor. All the fields are initialized there. And uh, once I found code like that, uh, so ints is a vector. Uh, we put push back uh, this structure shown in previous slide to our vector. And what's going on here is a possible copy. Uh, which is not uh, not optimal. You're lucky if it can be moved, but chances are it won't. Um, so uh, that's an optimization, uh, not an error, but this one is much better. Use in place back. Okay. Uh, now. Uh, let's say, what if we didn't have constru a constructor here? Uh, can we place it uh, in a vector? Well, turns out that in place back calls constructors. It doesn't use brace initialization. Uh, but in C20, uh, yes, we will be able to um, in place pods. So the problem here is that. Um, uh, creation of pod types currently doesn't work in a placeback. Yes. Mm, so the moral is don't use effective, more effective methods of um, containers uh, rather than pushing and inserting copies of objects there. Or not necessarily copies, but uh, in constructing them in place is really better. Okay. Another one from our code. Um, this one again was found during the code review and the problem seemed to be a little bit different than it turned out to be. So here we go again. Uh, we have a map. Uh, we push, uh, insert a pair there. So the pair gets copied. Um, let's emplace it and, and call it a day, right? It's much better. Uh, or is it? Well. The problem is not really in the insertion here in this code. It's in a double lookup here. Um, when you call map uh, maps find method, you look up a key. When you emplace it or push it back or whatever, add an element, you look look it up again. So in this case, this wasn't optimal. Um, so why do we even bother with code like this when we can do that? Um, I think it's much prettier, um, especially that try and place won't uh, break any data uh, you pass to it, and it uh, will return a success uh, flag. Um, so you can check whether or not it was successful. You can do it in one lookup and don't even care about um, about uh, checking whether uh, there is such an element or not. So search only once. This also concerns, by the way, multiple calls of 
functions like strlen in loops or in ifs or stuff like that. Okay, so that's the last time we'll check uh, the questions during this. Okay, so questions are empty, moving on. Um, okay, signed and unsigned uh, values uh, can play uh, jokes on you. Uh, this one was taken from one of internet forums. Um, I've removed um, some questionable parts from this, from the original text, but basically it goes like, uh, oh, it's broken, it doesn't work. Uh, complaints, complaints, complaints. Uh, when the poster was asked to show the code, uh, this is what we got. So what happens here is some hash calculation. And the problem is really, uh, by the way, uh, the problem was that um, the value uh, returned from the function was incorrect. Okay, let's take a look at this code. This is a signed integer. Uh, here, it at some point it overflows, and that's expected in this case. So it's expected to overflow uh, because uh, how it is overcome is by removing the sign from the resulting value. Uh, this line here drops the sign um, and returns. Um, basically uh, everything except the sign bit. Okay. Uh, so let's compile it. Let's see. Okay, sign, the sign is dropped. Uh, so the problem doesn't really seem to exist. Uh, but on that internet forum, uh, during the conversation, the further conversation, it turned out that uh, it was compiled on ARM with the unsigned char um, key passed to the compiler. Same code, uh, one thing changed is the common line. Uh, so let's try that. Oops. There is no sign uh, removal in this, um, in this example. Uh, because uh, if you look at this code again, uh, char is treated as unsigned char, and the compiler assumes that there won't be signed uh, overflow. Um, okay. So if you uh, if you really expect something to overflow. Do not use signed values. That's the moral here. Use unsigned. Um, all right. Uh, this is the last one. Um, this one is about uh, no accept. Well, everyone knows no accept, right? Um, if you declare a function no accept, you give uh, your compiler a guarantee that it won't throw, throw anything. So if you do throw, this is really bad because you get a terminate and your program stops. Um, if you do that, I call another function and it throws. Well, this is really bad. Uh, so this uh, thing um, inspired us one day to do a diagnostic rule for the analyzer to check if uh, a no, no except function calls a function which can throw. Um, so we did, and uh, we've come across an unexpected problem because it turns out that no except uh, works in mysterious ways. Uh, let's look at the DLL main, main function. What it does, it um, loads in, uh, it initializes your DLL as it loads, but the thing here is if it throws an exception, uh, the DLL won't unload from your process after that at all. Um, uh, that's Windows specific stuff, but anyway. So uh, 
when we created uh, the diagnostic about the no accept functions, we decided to expand it and take DLL main into account. And in one of our test projects, we came across this kind of code. So um, nothing suspicious here. It looks like API Windows API functions are called, or well, at least one. Uh, so we checked it and uh, I've got the error that something throws inside DLL main and it's not caught. Um, I was surprised as you can imagine. So uh, let's see what we have here. There's one call, DLL register server. Uh, it's an API function we know about, uh, about it. Uh, it's Essentially, it's written in C. Uh, it doesn't use any C++ specific things like exceptions. Um, it's related COM, not really interesting in this context, but anyway, and it doesn't throw. Um, API functions in Windows don't throw. So the diagnostic rules looks buggy. Um, or does it really? Uh, that's what we set out to figure out. Um, okay, if it was a surprise that we found um, the implementation of that seemingly um, Windows API function, but well, it happens, I guess. Um, uh, what happens inside that function is a bunch of other API functions are called and they don't throw. Um, as we know it, but let's take a look inside them. Well, uh, the first function we get into gives us a suspicious line, delete. Uh, so as we know, API functions are written in C, so it's clear that we, ha we are dealing with some custom API implementation here. Uh, and indeed, in one of the gold functions, this was found and this was uh, what made the analyzer uh, go into basically rage mode, I should say, um, because the new is a potentially throwing operation. Uh, even if you don't get a bad alloc exception, uh, the constructor of the object can throw in this case. So this is what was found. Um, and the moral here is, uh, make sure you don't let any exceptions slip out of your no accept functions or functions which have kind of no accept semantics like DLL main. Uh, you're not supposed to throw anything out of it. Uh, and okay, uh, so this is question time if we have time still. Um, Right, I'll wait uh, and see if there are any questions for another um, couple of minutes, I guess, and then uh, we can uh, uh, wrap things up. Uh, thank you all for listening. I hope it was at least entertaining uh, to some of you.